Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, I think we're ready to begin, or will be. I have a few questions here, and I even have a sheet to answer one of them that I left in the sacristy. Typical, right? You think you have everything together, and then you don't? Don't hear me, huh? That's God's way of saying that I talk too much. <laughs> because if you can hear me, then that means that you actually have to listen, right? Let me grab one more thing from the sacristy and we'll be ready to start. So, shall we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, we ask you to accompany us as we learn about you, that we can grow in our knowledge and love of the Church and of our faith, and that we can come to a greater appreciation of all things that are holy. For we ask all these things through Christ our Lord, Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So there were some questions that we had from last time that are actually really good questions. So I'm going to try to begin with some of the easier ones and work our way to the hard ones like last time. That way we have plenty of time to get to those. So the first one is, are the words of the Our Father prayer changing? the lead us not into temptation. If you remember, the Pope had talked about that a while ago, about changing it to, and let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As far as I know, they're only doing that in the Italian language. They're not doing it in any of the others, including English. I think part of the reason they're not doing it in English is we have so many Protestants that if the Pope starts changing the translation of the Our Father, people are going to say that now the Pope thinks he's better than Jesus because he's changing the words to the Our Father as if Jesus spoke English. He didn't, obviously. In fact, in what language was the Our Father prayer written for us? It was not written in Aramaic. It was in Greek. He might have spoken Aramaic. It might have been said originally in Aramaic, but it was written down for us in the New Testament, which was written in Koine Greek. So, if you really want to know what it says, learn the Greek. <laughs> Next. How many times can you receive communion? Can you receive communion more than once in a 24-hour time period? The answer is yes. You can receive communion more than once in a 24-hour time period. You can receive it twice, actually. But there's one little catch to that. The second time has to be at a Mass. In other words, you go to Mass in the morning, you go to the hospital, you're visiting somebody, a priest or Eucharistic minister comes in to give communion to the person in the hospital. That would be your second time if you did receive communion. Can you receive communion? No, because you were already at Mass and the second time is not a Mass. Let's say you are a Eucharistic minister who's taking communion to someone else. You go to the morning Mass, you go to their house, you knock on the door, they had a doctor's appointment they forgot to tell you about, and you'd have no clue when they're going to be home. It's already late, you could bring it back to the church, but if there's nobody at the offices or wherever, you, what do you do? Well, you've already had communion once, you can't have it a second time. So there's a few options, one of which is that you place it in a small container with water to dissolve it, 
and then bury the water and what would remain of the host. Um, that's the most appropriate thing to do. If we can bring it back to the church while it's still open or otherwise, that would be best. But if we've already received communion once, we can't receive it twice unless the second time is at a Mass. So for example, let's say that you go to the Saturday morning Mass. It's the Saturday morning Mass with the readings for Saturday. And then let's say that you come back to the church for confession and decide to stick around for the Saturday evening Mass. Those are the Mass for Sunday, right? Could you receive communion that time? Yes, because that's the second time and it's at a Mass. See, that's the difference. The first time doesn't matter how you receive it. The second time always has to be a Mass. You have a question? So what if somebody is presenting, so they're at the early Mass at 7.15 to present to the congregation, and then they come back to the 10.45 Mass to present whatever again, they have communion at the 7.15, and then they then have again at 10.45. Exactly. Because the second time is at a Mass. If it's not during a Mass, they cannot receive. But if you are at a Mass two times in the same day, presenting something as you just asked, that's fine. As long as the second time is at a Mass. It can't be communion call, it can't be the hospital, it can't be something else. Yes? So can it be more than two times? No. No. We have a maximum of two. Even for the priests, we're only allowed to say one Mass in a day or two for pastoral necessity or for weekends like the Sunday Mass or for holy days, we can say two and for pastoral necessity, three. So there should not be a time in which a priest says more than three Masses on a Sunday. If you notice the way we have the schedule divided, if there's only one person, there should still only be saying three Masses as a maximum, because again, even as a priest, we're not supposed to receive it more than that. I mean, I guess if it was an absolute necessity, we could, but it shouldn't be something that's planned or regular, so. Any more questions about communion before we move to the next? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, when at weddings, they have not a full Mass, but it's <laughs> but I was just wondering, is that considered a mass even though it's not a full mass? Because it wasn't a full, full mass. I wasn't there to know what they didn't have. But. So if it's a wedding that's not a full mass, whenever there's a wedding that's not a full mass, it's a wedding ceremony. Okay. And the way that that works is it's basically the mass from the beginning all the way up to the homily. Then after the homily, you would have the exchange of rings and the vows and everything. Then you would have the intercessions, the Lord's Prayer, a blessing, and you're done. There's no communion. So you see the same thing for funerals. You can have a funeral mass, which has the whole mass with communion, or there's a funeral service, which has the readings, the preaching, you incense the body and everything just as normal, but there's no actual sacrifice, there's no actual communion. It ends after that part. So, yeah, in a wedding situation like that, there's no mass because you haven't received communion. You've, re you've been to the service, but it's not a mass per se. Mm -hmm. Why is it That's just the rule. Um, it's an arbitrary rule, but it's still a rule. The idea is that we should not try to receive communion too many times, basically because familiarity breeds contempt. When we become so accustomed to it, we begin to not appreciate it as much. Um, yeah, think about it. When we had COVID and there were no public masses and people couldn't go to communion, how much more did they appreciate when they could come back and receive communion? it made a huge difference. I mean, I saw people crying when they came back to church for the first time in a while. It just shows how valuable they, they missed it because they might have been receiving it so frequently that they took it for granted. 
but when they couldn't take it anymore, suddenly they appreciated it a lot more. So, any other questions about communion before we move on? Yes. Hmm? Yeah, in the back, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you receive communion then. Mm -hmm. And four thirty in the afternoon you go to Sunday Mass actually. Mm -hmm. You can receive both times, correct? Correct. Because the second time is a mass. Yeah. So as long as the second time is always at a mass, that's what matters. So like if you go to the morning mass, like we're gonna to have tomorrow, where we have the morning mass in Virgin at eight thirty. Well there's also a funeral tomorrow for George Cunningham, if you remember. So if you go to the morning mass at 8.30, you stick around and stay for the funeral at 11, you could receive communion at both masses because they're both masses. So just putting that out there. Do you have a question? Yes. <clears throat> During COVID, I just heard this from one of my nieces. Her father was in a senior community down in Washington. Mm -hmm. And she said, I know, and she doesn't practice, but he does. So I was asking her about that. She said, oh, yeah, you could watch Mass, you know, if they have it on a closed circuit. And then they would give communion at the door for him, outside his door with wine. And that sounded terrifying to me. <laughs> so you're not supposed to do that. No. The question was, during COVID at this particular senior center, they would have mass on the closed circuit TV, but at communion time, they would actually leave the host and a little of the wine outside of the door. That's not supposed to happen. That would be an abuse. Um, the church has never said that we should do it that way. So yeah, that's a little sketchy. Um, we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we move on? Yes. So we know what person who has been married for nine years, but when she got married, her husband um, was divorced. She married him in or so she didn't get married in the church. She was practicing Catholic though. And she she was told that she's not supposed to receive the union. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So if someone is married to someone who was divorced, they weren't married in the church, should they receive communion? Well, here's the answer to that. The first answer is yes and no. <laughs> here's the thing. When it comes to a situation like that, if someone is married to someone who was divorced outside of the church, technically they should not be receiving communion. That is correct. We are not supposed to receive communion unless everything is right as it should be. At the same time, that person might realize that they have done something that is not completely 100% the way that it should be, meaning they didn't get married in the church. They might have gone to a priest and have already gone through the process and even done a blessing, we call it a convalidation of the marriage, in a church. And they might not have told everybody about it, and they might be receiving communion because they actually can. Sometimes people do things that we don't know about, even if we think we know everything because everybody talks, sometimes people don't talk about very personal things. So they might have actually fixed the situation with the priest without advertising it to everybody, and then their conscience is clear. And then you have another possibility, which is they're an older couple who are not engaging in things reserved to marriage. They basically are companions who live in the same house. They're married legally. They're not married in the church, obviously. They're sleeping maybe even in separate rooms. They live in the same house, they share bills, but they're not engaging in other things. If they have gone to confession and they have not committed any sins, technically they could receive communion because even though they are civilly married, they're not engaging in sin if they live in the same house. Give you an example. How many people do we know have roommates, especially with the cost of things today? Roommates aren't having sex, I hope. They could be, but I hope not. <laughs> Today's world, you never know. But if they're not engaging in those things, then what's the sin? You see, that's the thing. 
because in the eyes of the church, they're not engaging in things related to marriage. Technically, if they've gone to confession and confessed all of their sins, they could receive communion. So I always say this, this is my, my go-to thought for people when it comes to that kind of situation. We have to remember that when it comes to communion, St. Paul tells us that anyone who eats and drinks the body and blood of Christ unworthily is eating and drinking their own condemnation. <coughs> it's not my condemnation, it's not Susie Q's condemnation, it's not Joe Schmo's condemnation, it's the person who's doing it. And if they, in their conscience, present themselves to communion and they are worthy, good. God bless them. If they present themselves to communion and they are not in a state of grace or they are not in a worthy condition, that is between them and God. God will take care of it. God will judge them accordingly because if they know they're not supposed to do it, and they do it anyway. And I will say this, having heard confessions, I've heard a few in my day. You would be surprised how many people will confess as several mortal sins, and among them is, and I received communion while in a state of mortal sin. <laughs> What's the difference? They knew they were in a state of mortal sin. They still presented themselves for communion. They still received communion knowing that they shouldn't. Therefore, even though no one else knows about their sin, no one else knows what they've done, they know. And if they died before they confessed, that would be between them and God. So what I always say is, if someone is in a marriage that's, I'll use the word irregular, meaning they haven't gone through the process of getting it blessed by the church, all they really need to do is talk to the priest, work on what they need to do. If they need to go through the annulment process, the priest will walk them through it, work toward getting things taken care of so that there's no question about it. But when it comes to the everybody else who's not that couple, we should encourage them, we should pray for them, but we should let them do what they want, knowing that if they do the wrong thing, it's on their conscience. We've told them, they know, and again, they might have already worked things out and we just don't know about it. So that's why I always say it's better not to judge. She has not received communion in 30 years if she wants to. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is call the parish office <laughs> and set up an appointment and we can talk about it. We can talk about what process would need to be done, what needs to be gone through, and we'll find a way to make it work. I always say that there's a solution. It may not be the easiest one. It may not be the quickest one. But if someone really is determined to receive communion, we'll find a way to make it happen. So like I said, take one of the bulletins call the parish office, set up an appointment, and we'll talk about whatever needs to be done. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm if someone is married with somebody, they never been married, but they're married to somebody that was divorced, but they were never married in church. Mm -hmm. So is that marriage? There's a little process for that one too. If they went to the justice of the peace, they didn't get married in any church whatsoever, and they got divorced, the church does something similar to an annulment, it's called freedom to marry, where they basically say, this person was civilly married, it was not done as a sacrament in any church whatsoever, because we as the Catholics recognize the sacraments of the other churches. So we recognize the baptisms of other churches, we recognize the marriages of other churches. So if they were married by a justice of the peace, not in a church, not in a semblance of a sacrament, then we give a document called a freedom to marry, which proves that they are not sacramentally married to someone. It's an easy thing to do. And then would you say if um, they were both married by this, the person who's getting married was also married before by the Justice of the Peace, but now they're divorced, and now they're going to get married to somebody from the church, and they want to get married. Correct. You talk to the parish priest, and the priest would talk about how to do the paperwork, just so that once it's all done, everything's clear, the church can give its blessing, because if they were married before, by a justice of the peace, it's super easy to fix. It really is. It's only when it's done in a church that it gets a little complicated, but even then, 
it's not too complicated to work through. Trust me, I've seen the horror stories. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. Is a priest allowed to say, I will only uh, give communion in a hand, not on the tongue? Is it possible for a priest to say, only in the hand or on the tongue? The answer is, Yes and no. The reason I say that is, technically, we're not supposed to be able to refuse either the hand or in the tongue. But some bishops are a little funny about those things, and they allow it to happen even though it shouldn't. So and technically, the no. Today, the priest did that. About 20 people didn't receive communion. What? They wanted to, he would not receive Where was that? Where was that? Oh, well, I don't know what they do over there. <laughs> I was going to say, that wasn't here, was it? Because I may have to talk to somebody. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's not supposed to happen. If, if someone wants to receive on the hand or on the tongue, both are accepted options and there shouldn't be a problem. So if, if someone feels unhappy about what happened, they should contact the bishop of the diocese where that church is and talk to them about it. I was during the COVID when everybody was afraid of oh. it. and they wouldn't all come to church or wouldn't do anything else. Yeah, during COVID, it's, yeah. Whether he was afraid of it or what, I don't know, but it, uh, he announced it right before communion. Hmm. Well, like I said, if someone wants to, they could talk to the bishop about it. If someone wants to, they can talk to the bishop about it or the bishop's office. But with COVID, everything kind of got crazy. I'd never seen an, an empty church for Easter until then. Because in Philadelphia, they didn't have any, in, they weren't allowing people to come to the churches. So for the Easter vigil, for the first time ever, I, had to, I was the one who was supposed to carry the candle down the aisle, and then you had to chant the... Um, the exaltet, you know, that we do at the beginning, you know, but normally as you're coming down, you light all the little candles and the church gets lighter because of all the candles. Well, there were like, I don't know, maybe 10 people total, including all of us, in the church, and it was a church that was as big as this one. So, I mean, 10 people singing on the exaltet to an empty church was the weirdest thing ever. So, again, with COVID, everything got crazy. So, I'm hoping things are kind of going back to normal. Well, let's move on to some of these other ones because we could talk forever on these about communion in particular. So, next one is this one, which someone asked. Is listening to a rosary on a phone or saying the end of the prayers the same as saying the rosary? So, like, for example, you have EWTN on TV. They say the rosary with the sisters at certain times of the day or... You know, you have it on a radio or something and you're listening to it. <clears throat> Does listening to it count as praying it? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> Surprise! If you remember from last time when we talked about the rosary, the rosary is a mental prayer. And we're supposed to think about the mystery for the amount of time it takes to say those 10 Hail Marys. So, do you have to actually say the 10 Hail Marys? No. You don't have to actually say them because it's a timekeeper for the amount of time that we're supposed to be thinking about the mystery. If we're watching it on EWTN and they're praying it, and while they're saying the 10 Hail Marys, we're thinking about the mystery, even if we're not saying the words, are we praying the rosary? Yes. If we say the words and we're not thinking about the mystery, are we praying the rosary? Kind of. <laughs> we are saying the words. We have the intention. But it's supposed to be a mental prayer, not one that's particularly vocal. So, if we're listening to the radio and they're doing the rosary and we're thinking about the mystery while they're doing the Hail Marys, yes, we have prayed the rosary. Do we have to say the words? It's helpful, but not necessarily. And if someone's sick, for example, and they really can't say the words, 
they don't have to. They can follow along as long as they're thinking about the mystery. That's why I said last time, I don't encourage people to pray the rosary while driving. If you're meditating on the mystery, you're not looking at the road. Don't do it. Pay attention to the road. If you want to pray something, either imagine God in the passenger seat and have an actual conversation. You know, Lord, this morning's going to be kind of crazy. I've got all of these things going on. Thank you for helping me wake up and get out of bed and actually get dressed with both of my socks the right color. Whatever it is you want to say. Or you could do a different chaplet, like the Chaplet of Divine Mercy or the Chaplet of St. Michael or there's a thousand of them out there. Ones that don't require us to be thinking about something else so we can focus on the road while we're casually having a chat with God. That's what I recommend. Any other questions about the rosary? Yes. Father, um, I'm 75 years old. When I went to school, I don't remember saying the rosary uh, with a mystery. Mm -hmm. Was it always part of the rosary or just something that came? I mean, we had Sisters of Mercy on all Catholic schools that I'll ever remember doing the mystery. The answer is yes, it was always part of it. The problem is, and this is what I talked about a little bit last time, I didn't go into details, is a lot of people were not praying it in the complete way. They were so focused on teaching people the words and how to go the round the beads that they didn't focus on the mystery part. They were supposed to focus on both, but especially in some of the Catholic schools, they focused on how to work around the beads and they were less focused on the mysteries, which was a mistake, if you really think about it. They should have done both, but because of whatever, they didn't. So a lot of people never learned about meditating on it. We mentioned the mysteries at the beginning, and then people would go straight into the prayers without thinking about them. But the reason that they mention the mystery before they start the Our Father is during that time, you're supposed to be thinking about the mystery that's mentioned. So you're right, it wasn't always taught, but yes, it was always there. So, any other questions about rosaries? No. So I'll read my handwriting product. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this one first because it's a little easier. <laughs> Not that I don't know the answers, but it'll take a little more explanation. This is super easy. What is the difference between um, priests, monks, friars, brothers, nuns, sisters? What's the difference? Well, that's the easy answer. When it comes between monks and friars, because we're Mercedarian friars, my community. We're not Mercedarian monks. A monk is somebody who's tied to a monastery or an abbey, and their whole life is supposed to be spent there. Think about the Trappists that we have just around the corner. They have their abbey, they live at the abbey, they work at the abbey, they will probably die and be buried at the abbey. Their whole world is in that one place the abbey. They might go out for some things here or there, but they always come back to the abbey, and the abbey is where they are. They are monks tied to the abbey. Nuns are the same thing. Nuns are tied to a convent, but they're called what we call cloistered. They stay inside, and they don't come out. And in the traditional nuns, you have like the, the grill, remember? the metal grill that separates the nuns from everybody else. They don't leave the building, they don't leave the complex. They go in and they stay in until they die. So nuns and monks are basically the same thing. They're tied to a single monastery or convent. It's where they live, it's where they work, it's where they die and probably will be buried too. Friars is a generic term for priests and brothers because it includes both. And then on the other hand, you have sisters. So sisters and brothers are on the same thing, male and female, that's the only difference. They are people who are in a religious community, who are not priests, 
who do more than just work at an abbey. You might work in a school, you might work in a church, you might work in some ministry, you might work in a soup kitchen, hospital, but you also can get moved around from place to place. I mean, if you look at where I've been, I was, I'm here now. Before here, I was in Philadelphia. Before Philadelphia, I was in Florida. Before Florida, I was in Italy. Before Italy, I was in, you see what I'm saying? You know, we get moved around. My life is not tied to a single place. So a sister or a brother is the same. They're in religious life, they are not priests, and they are not tied to one location. They are sent wherever they're needed, as needed. A priest, obviously we know what a priest is. There's two types of priests. There's a religious priest, and there's secular or diocesan priest. A diocesan priest is tied to one diocese and only in one diocese. A religious priest is at the order's control. The order tells them where to go, whether they're an order priest for a monastery or an order priest that gets sent to different places, hospitals and prisons and other places. So, monk and a nun are the same. They're tied to one location. Brother and sister are the same. They go to different places and do ministry with the people. Priests are rather diocesan, tied to one single diocese, or an order, they go where the order sends them. So in my case, I am a religious priest because I belong to a religious order, and I'm a friar because a friar is the male version of priests and brothers together. Brother Raymond is also a friar, but he's not a priest. So remember, a friar can be a priest or a brother, a sister is a sister, a monk is a monk, and a nun is a nun. Monks cannot be friars, they're not the same. But a priest could be a friar, and a brother could be a friar, right? Are we kind of clear? I would draw it on a board, except I don't have one. <laughs> A um, couple quick questions. Um, we'll start with this one. Will we have free will in heaven? We will always have free will because God made us that way. And that goes with a follow-up. If yes, could this result in another fall? The answer is no. And the reason for that is if in our free will we have chosen to do good, we've chosen to be with God, and we are actually standing in the presence of God, we would be so overwhelmed with it that we would not want to separate ourselves from it. That makes us a little different than the angels because the angels were with God. They were there, they saw what it was, and they chose to abandon it. They didn't have the trials and tribulations of earthly life that led them to heaven where they could be rewarded. They were already there and chose to abandon it. So you see, that's the difference between humans and angels. When you die, you will never be an angel. I hate to tell you that. They're like different species. It's like a dog becoming a human in heaven. It doesn't happen. What happens is, when we die, our bodies and our souls are separated. At the resurrection, our bodies and our souls are reunited, and we are like the angels in that we are standing in the presence of God with the angels. We're not becoming angels, just like angels don't become humans. We're different. We're always going to be different. Jesus did not become an angel. Jesus became a human, which according to some traditions is why the devil rebelled in the first place. The devil, as an angel, refused to bow down to a human. And if Jesus is human, he would have to. Pride. So, I hope that answers the question. We will always have free will because that's a human quality, and we will continue to be humans in heaven. Will there be another fall? No, because if we've gone through all of the trials and tribulations of life and have still chosen to be good, when we are rewarded with the vision of God, we will be so overwhelmed with the goodness and love that we would not choose otherwise, because we had an opportunity to choose otherwise, and we didn't take it. That's what life is about. Where will we choose to go? God doesn't send anybody to hell. We send ourselves. 
by our own choices, our own selfishness, and our own desire to come out on top. they still have aborted fetuses still have free will even if they weren't born because they're human so it's one of those where even if they were not allowed to be born even if they were only one cell when they were aborted because of abortion drugs you know they're still human and they would still have a, a human soul and a human free will so in heaven god would give them a glorified body in his own image and likeness with the free will too Next, when is divorce slash annulment okay? And what about abuse of a spouse? Should we talk to you guys about something? <laughs> teasing, teasing. I'll give you an example of an annulment case that I took care of when I was in a different diocese. And you tell me if this was a marriage or not, and if this was an annulment case or not. There was a couple who were professionals in their particular field. They both worked in different companies. They met each other at a convention for their particular profession. They liked each other. They were friendly. They started doing social things together. You know, it's always good to bring somebody along rather than go by yourself. So they kind of, you know, accompanied each other. They kind of liked each other. They decided that, you know, you can get tax benefits if you're married. So they got married more for convenience than for actual love. They live together for almost a year before they get divorced. Now, in the meantime, you have the man's house and the woman's house because, you know, they lived in separate houses before they met. The woman's house was physically closer to where both the man and the woman worked. They were, it was just closer. It was easier on gas. You don't have to drive as far. So the man sells his house and moves into what was the woman's house so that they can live together as a married couple, closer to both of their workplaces. The reason they divorced was he wanted to use another room in the house as a little office space because he needed a little more room to work in, and he refused to give her more than the $450 rent he was paying to live in her house. Now listen to what I said. He was paying $450 a month to live in his wife's house. And when he wanted a little more room, she wanted to jack it up to $700 and he refused. In their refrigerator, they had a piece of tape down the middle. His groceries are on one side, her groceries are on the other side. They never combined their finances. And after a, almost a year of marriage, they got divorced because he wasn't going to pay more rent to live in her house. Was that a marriage? It's clear that that's not a marriage, right? So an annulment in that case is warranted. They did not understand the unitive part where the two become one. They didn't understand that. An abusive spouse is another case where if someone is in an abusive relationship, they may not have known that this person was abusive. They may not have had any idea that this person got violent. Maybe they get violent when they drink, but they never got drunk when they were dating. You didn't know that this person was going to be violent. You got into this marriage, now they're violent. You get out of the relationship because you're fearing for your own safety. There would be grounds for an annulment there too. Because, again, any time that there is physical force and danger and all these other things, there's all kinds of wiggle room when it comes to that. Because no one would willingly enter into that kind of relationship. And if they had known that that was what it was going to be, they wouldn't have been there, would they? So there's other reasons, too. Like, for example, let's say that someone lied to you. Let's say that you came from a family where you had drunken parents that were abusive and you said you could never marry anybody who was an alcoholic and you're dating somebody who is an alcoholic secretly and they know that it bothers you so they don't tell you because they're afraid that it would turn you away from them. You get married and then they show up drunk. They lied about who they were. 
or they presented themselves as someone other than who they actually were, or they didn't tell the truth, they intentionally deceived people, or you have like the shotgun weddings, you know, where someone gets pregnant and the father says, you're going to marry my daughter regardless of if you really want to or not, you're forced into it. All of these are examples of ways in which an annulment would happen. We don't accidentally marry people. I mean, not sacramentally speaking. So that said, there are reasons that are acceptable. I hope that that's a clear answer. There's all kinds of things that can be said about it. We could have more discussion specifically about that at another time if people are interested. Next, why are priests called father when the Bible says not to? It comes from Matthew 29 or 23, 9. See, I'm bad with numbers. Do not call anyone on earth father. You have one father in heaven. He also says don't call anyone teacher because you're a teacher in heaven. All of these things, but you have to put it in context. You can't take a single verse, rip it out of the Bible, and say this is the justification for what I want to say. What did he say immediately before that? Because in that particular passage, he's talking to his disciples about the Pharisees. And he says, the Pharisees, he says, do not be like the Pharisees. They lengthen their tassels. They, they want seats of honor in the synagogues. They want to be called rabbi. They want all of these things. Why do they want that? They want to draw attention to themselves. They want people to honor and respect them. They want to show their authority. They want to show their power. And titles like father or teacher or other things are little ways that they use to draw authority and power to themselves. And Jesus is saying, you're supposed to be humble. You're supposed to be servants of others. So when Jesus says, call no one on earth your father, call no one on earth your teacher, all these other things, he says that, it's interesting, call no one on earth teacher, which is rabbi, but then his own disciples are calling him teacher, and he doesn't say anything to them. He could say, well, I am the teacher, so that's a little different. But it's one of those where sometimes what he's saying is meant to be figurative, more so than literal. I'll give you another example. Not far after that, Jesus is saying, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it's better to be cast into and go into heaven with one hand than to be cast into the fires of Gehenna with two. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Did he mean that literally? Does he want us to mutilate ourselves because we've sinned? Because I hate to say this, but I'm looking at all of you. You all have two eyes. You all have two hands. As far as I can tell, you all have two feet. Have you ever sinned with any of those things? Just say it. Because sometimes it's meant to be figurative. It's not intended to be a literal command of what we're supposed to do. In this case about calling people by titles, he says that their authority or their respect should be respected, but we shouldn't be focused only on titles. We shouldn't be focused on seats of honor. We shouldn't be focused on all of these other things that as his disciples, we should be focused on bringing the message of the gospel to others rather than waiting for them to come to us and treat us with respect. What did he say just after that passage? He says, the son of man came to serve, not to be served. It's the same idea. And when we put all of these things in context, it's how are we serving others rather than that desire to be served? And in being served, we want people to call us particular things. We want the place of honor. We want the recognition. We want the trumpets blaring before us so everybody looks to see us. That's what he's talking about. I hope that's kind of clear. Again, that's something we could go into more detail about. It's like a mini scripture study kind of thing if people are interested. Next. That's what I have my little sheet here for. <clears throat> and this is a very good question, by the way. Because this is something that I would say 80% of Catholics don't even know about. What is the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the other Catholic churches? I mean, in the news lately, you've been hearing about the Ukrainian Catholic Church. So what's the difference? Let me ask you guys that first. 
What's the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Ukrainian Catholic Church? They don't what? Yeah, the Ukrainian Church is Ukrainian, and yes, they do have a pope. The pope. It's the same pope. So that's the catch. The Catholic churches that are real churches, that are actually Catholic churches. Because you could have, you know, fake churches that use the word Catholic in them that aren't Catholic, but in the real churches that are Catholic, they all have the same Pope. That's what makes them Catholic, is the Ukrainian Catholic Church has a head of their Ukrainian church who's like an archbishop who's under the Pope. So you see, they are different churches with their different traditions, but they all have the same Pope. So Pope Francis is the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. There is a leader of the Ukrainian Catholic Church who coordinates things for them, but his boss is the Pope. So, how many churches are there? We just said two, obviously. And Brother Raymond can't answer because he is the master of all trivia. Orthodox or not Catholic? Orthodox or not Catholic? <clears throat> hmm? Byzantine church doesn't exist. There's a Byzantine rite, but that's not a church. Just like the Roman Catholic church goes by the Latin rite. You've heard that before. The Latin rite is the way that we worship. The Byzantine rite is the way that they worship but they're not churches. It's a little different. See, that's why we're doing this. So it is a Catholic church? It would be Catholic, yes. But they follow a different ritual. <laughs> but there's different churches that all follow the Byzantine rite. Because you would have and it's a Catholic church, we went to the Catholic church. But mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was a... Eastern church. And for communion... They have the they cup have with the spoon. Yeah. And they put it on the spoon and dip it in the wine. Mm -hmm. and, and you tilt your head back and they put the spoon, yeah. Well, they don't, you don't wrap your lips around the spoon. You don't wrap your lips around the spoon. <laughs> you, you, they tilt it in. I didn't know. Yeah, no, they don't, you don't lick the spoon, you don't touch the spoon. I Yeah. <laughs> so I have a list. That's how many there are. There are 22 churches, so there's ours, and 21 others. So here's where the, what they are, and I'll even tell you when they were officially recognized. When I say officially recognized, I mean they might have had their own leader, but they weren't following the Pope. But when they became under the Pope and were officially named as a Catholic church, that's the dates that I'm giving you here. So we have the Latin church, our church, which is from the first century. Do you know how many people are belonging to the Roman Catholic Church? How many people belong to the Roman Catholic Church? We're not talking about all these other churches. We're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. The answer is 1,295,000,000 people. It's an interesting thought. Then you have this Cyril Malabar Catholic Church, which was established in the 50s. When I say 50s, I mean like 5 0, not 1950. 5 0. <laughs> then you have the Marianite Church, which was in the 4th century, so that's the 300s. Then you have the Chaldean Catholic Church which was established in 1552. That, by the way, the Chaldean Church, is located in Iraq. So there's been a, a Catholic Church recognized with, by the Pope since 1552. Then there's the Ukrainian Catholic Church for 1595, the Belarusian Catholic Church in 1596, 
the Greek Catholic Church of Croatia and Serbia in 1611, the Albanian Catholic Church in 1628, the Ruthenian Catholic Church in 1646, the Slovak Catholic Church in 1646, the Romanian Catholic Church in 1697, the Melkite Catholic Church in 1726, the Coptic Catholic Church in 1741, the Armenian Church in 1742, the Syriac Church, the Italo-Albanian Church, the Ethiopian, the Bulgarian, the Russian Catholic Orthodox Church, not Orthodox, Russian Catholic Church was established in 1905. You have the Greek Church, the Hungarian Church, the Cyril Malinkar Church, the Macedonian Church, and the Eritrean Catholic Church, which was established in 2015. All of the churches, Latin and all of these Eastern, combined, there are 1,313,000,000 Catholics in the world. And the Pope is the Pope of them all. So, looking at the other side of my sheet, this is divided by right. Right is what we use to describe how we do services. So when we say the Latin rite, everybody who belongs to the Latin rite does mass the same kind of way. All of those who belong to the Byzantine rite do mass the same kind of way, even if they're in different countries and different languages. All of those in these other rites do them the same way. So here's an example. There are three churches who follow the Alexandrian rite which is founded in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. That's the Coptic Church, which is housed in Cairo, the Ethiopian Church, which is in Addis Ababa, and the Eritrean Church, which is found in Asmara, Eritrea. Then there's one church that follows the Armenian rite, and that's the Armenian Church, which is located in Beirut, Lebanon, there is, for the Byzantine Church, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 churches use the Byzantine Rite. Those include the Ukrainian Church, Belarusian Church, Greek Church of Croatia and Serbia, the Albanian Church, Ruthenian, Slovak, Romanian, Melkite, Italo-Albanian, Bulgarian, Russian, Greek, Hungarian, and Macedonian. Then there's the East Syriac Church, which includes the Syro-Malabar in India and the Chaldean in Iraq. There's one church that follows the Latin rite, that's ours, the Roman Catholic Church. And then for West Syriac, there's the Maronite Church in Lebanon, the Syriac Church in Syria, and the Syro Malankar Rite in India. As an example of East versus West, you see how we have this communion rail here? In the Eastern churches, it goes all the way to the ceiling. It's not a rail, it's a wall. And it has three doors one in the middle, and then one on either side of it. And in between the doors, there's icons. There's an icon of Christ, usually on this side. And there's an icon of Our Lady, usually on this side. And they do all of the prayers outside of the screen. And then they do the prayers for the, the sacrifice, the Eucharistic prayer, inside the screen. And then when it's time for communion, the priest stands in the doorway. And the people come up. There's usually an icon in the middle. They reverence the icon in the middle. They walk around the icon. They tilt their head back. They open their mouth very wide. The priest, in the rite itself, takes the, the bread that they have used for the Eucharist. They pour them into the wine. They dump all of them in. And then they absorb all of the wine, the precious blood. And then they have these really long-handled spoons. That's what you were talking about. And they dip it in and they pull out one of these little pieces of bread that is saturated with the, the precious blood. You tilt your head back and they say, the servant of God, and if they know your name, they'll say it 
you know, receives the precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen, whatever they say. And then they tilt it and it falls into your mouth. You don't wrap your lips around the spoon and you make the sign of the cross and you've received communion. We had the rail, which was much shorter, and there's no icons on it, because we had statues, they had icons. But the symbolism is the same. The symbolism is this. The rail and the sanctuary was supposed to represent heaven. So that's why some of them have the stars and other things painted in the ceiling. You know, they have heaven. And everything on that side is supposed to represent earth. It's not a separation of the priests and all those other fantasies that people talk about. The idea was symbolically, at the moment of communion, Jesus, in the form of this host, comes from heaven, leaves heaven, and goes to earth to dwell inside us, literally, as the host. So when we receive communion, Jesus is leaving heaven to come to earth, and that Christmas image that we have of Jesus being born is supposed to be what communion is. We are receiving Jesus, yes, but he is born in our hearts. He is coming from heaven, coming down to earth, and in that moment of communion, earth and heaven are united in Jesus and we become one with him. That was the symbolism. That's why these rails and walls and things were there. It wasn't to separate anybody. It was to symbolically show how special we are, that Jesus himself came down from heaven, descended not because he needed to, but because he wanted to, to leave heaven and to physically come to us. And in that moment of communion when we receive him, it's like the nativity, he's born on earth inside us. That was the symbolism. We don't talk about it so much these days, do we? We don't talk about it at all. <laughs> it is pretty cool. <laughs> but that's why they had these differences. We, in the Latin church, up until the Second Vatican Council, only had one Eucharistic prayer, which is the first Eucharistic prayer. I say it often, but not all the time. The, had the fourth Eucharistic prayer, which was taken from the Byzantine, well, modeled on it. So when you listen to the fourth Eucharistic prayer, it's modeled off of the prayers that come from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which was written actually earlier than ours. It's older than ours. Those prayers are older than the Latin church's canon. And they're really beautiful. I'll give you an example of some of what it says. Not all of it, because that's just too long. I happen to have it right here. What page is it on? It's on the page that has the Roman numeral four. It really does. It's right there with the Roman numeral four because it's the fourth Eucharistic prayer. And this is what it says, just as an example, okay? And think about what this is saying. We'll skip the preface, which is particular to it. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great, and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the Creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so loved the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior, made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He shared our human nature in all things but sin. He keeps going. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. 
It keeps going, but I want to point out something here. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant, Francis our Pope, Michael our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you. Notice they're not the same people. Those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. That's a lot of people when you think about it. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. We don't assume if someone is going to hell because of something that they did or the life that they lived, whose faith you alone have known. Think about what some of these prayers are saying. And these are older than the ones that we have for the Roman church. So you see, that's why these different rites and things can give some very beautiful prayers. They can give us some very beautiful things to think about. They even have prayers in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom that you say before communion, talking about how we are unworthy to receive him and not for anything that we do, but from his own goodness and his own grace, he comes to us and makes us worthy so that we can partake of him. It's interesting to see the prayers that they say that we don't have. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. It's just different ways of looking at the same thing, the same sacrifice, the same belief, because all of the Catholic churches believe what we believe, all of them. They might pray differently. They might use different actions or different ways of doing things, but they all believe the same beliefs. They all worship the same God, and they all do it in a way that is approved by the church. And one of the things that I would like to see in, in my lifetime is when people will stop assuming that the way they personally like to do things is the only way that things can be done. Because what if we actually had an open mind where we were willing to accept people wherever they are in their faith journey where we could actually get along with people without judging them because they do something in a way different than the way that we do it. Give you an example. If somebody wants to pray with their hands like this, and somebody else wants to pray like this, and someone wants to pray like this, <laughs> should I care? It's them and their relationship with God. What I might think is disrespectful, they may be paralyzed and can't move. And here I am judging someone based on what I see without knowing the truth. They might have had a stroke and be numb on a part of their body. Who am I to judge the way someone does something? Now, as long as they're not doing something that's off the wall crazy, I mean, if we want to throw ourselves flat of our face right here in the middle of the, the aisle when we're receiving communion, that's a little different. But if somebody wants to genuflect before they receive communion, or if somebody wants to receive on the hand, or somebody wants to receive on the tongue, or somebody wants to say a prayer of thanksgiving that takes a little longer than the time that the priest has before he says, let us pray, why should anybody else care? I mean, honestly, is my faith and my relationship with God dependent on what everybody else is doing in their prayers? I have heard people say, for example, with communion rails, that they could not be in a church where there's a communion rail because it's creating such separation and all these other things. You know what my next question when I hear that it said is? And what church are they going to? Because nine times out of ten, a piece of furniture, furniture, is the excuse not to go to any church. When someone says, I can't go to such and such a place because they have this chair or they have this furniture, what are they really saying? This is my excuse not to go to church and I have nothing else to say, so I'll find the most arbitrary thing. 
If furniture can disrupt your relationship with God, here's the secret, you don't have one. If furniture can interfere with your relationship with God, I would check that relationship with God because it might be one-sided. My dear brothers and sisters, I hate to pontificate, but I think that you understand what I'm saying. Why are there 22 different churches? Why are there so many different liturgical rites? Why are there so many different expressions of the same faith? Because God has willed it to be so. And people can do different things, and it's okay. We can all worship in a way that makes us feel comfortable, and it's okay. We don't have to have everybody, like cookie cutters, doing the exact same thing, and it's okay. If, when it's time to kneel for the consecration, somebody can't kneel, their knees are bad. If they sit on the pew, are they being disrespectful? Or if somebody cannot genuflect because their back is bothering them, or their knees, or if they get down, they'll never get back up. If they bow to the tabernacle rather than genuflect, are they being disrespectful? Why should we care what they do? Even if they just come in and just sit down without showing any reverence at all, isn't that between them and God? Let God take care of it, because he'll let them know how he feels about things. Are there any other questions? Because we still got, actually we don't. <laughs> well, we'll have to take one though. No, that's too low. <laughs> 43,000 Protestant churches is not enough because I lived in a city in Virginia when I went to school and they had storefront churches every other block. And it was an interesting observation and I don't say this to be disrespectful, so don't think that I'm being disrespectful. But the smaller the church, the longer the name. So like you would have a small church that could maybe hold 10 people and it would be Tabernacle of Praise of Church of the Good Shepherd of the Living Water Vine. And then you'd have like this mega church and it would be House of Prayer. So it was like the shorter name was the larger ones and the larger or the longer names was the smaller buildings. With the Protestant churches, not all of them even have seminaries. Not all of them have theological training. Not all of them have a formal education. In the South, where I'm from, somebody might wake up one day and say, I have been called by God to preach the gospel, and they'll preach the Bible according to how they personally interpret it. Without ever having studied it, without knowing anything about it, they feel inspired and they start a church. And you have hundreds of those. And if they have children, maybe one of their children will take over the church when they, they retire or whatever, or not. And if they don't, if they can't find another minister, the church closes. And then a few years later, another church will open with somebody else, and there's hundreds, thousands, millions. One, one more thing. Uh, in a long time, I, just, uh, I misunderstood the phrase of denomination. We are not a denomination. Is that correct? We are a church. All the others follow that is a denomination. Is that true? How do you look at that? Are we a denomination or are we the church and their denominations? It's all a matter of semantics. Because if you look at Christianity as a whole, each group would be a denomination. If you look at the church being the Catholic church and everybody else being Protestants because they were protesting the church, Protestants, that's where the name comes from. Protest the church, they were protesting that's where Protestant comes from. We change the O to an A sound, ah, but it's O, Protestant. Um, yeah, it's a matter of how you define the word denomination. It's funny how we have groups that call themselves non-denominational. Well, non-denominational is a denomination. So it's one of those oxymorons where it means something and the opposite at the same time. So.
was 240 last time. This time it was 260. So apparently, and if you look here, there's what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, um, yeah, so I, again, there was 260. So that's a good thing. Quick question, yes. Well, see, I actually encourage that. I encourage people to visit other churches, to learn what they believe, to see how we're similar and different. Because, I mean, even myself, I reach out to other ministers so we can talk about things. Now, being interested in learning about what other people believe doesn't mean that we have to switch to their faith or we have to believe what they believe. Because I can know about the Baptists or the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the whatever, without believing what they believe. And I can respect what they believe without saying, well, we're right, you're wrong, and all this other stuff. So I think it's good that we have an opportunity to learn about what other people believe and how they worship. That doesn't mean that we need to actively participate and go out of our way to, to be a part of it we need to remember that we are Catholic for a reason. And while it's true that they have some of the truth, we would say that we have the fullness of truth. That doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that they have an incomplete understanding of some things. We should still appreciate what they do have and what they can offer, and we should try to work together as a Christian family for the good of the community, in this case, Leroy or Virgin, and there's a few things that will be coming down the line soon that I'll be bringing to you guys to talk about. I've mentioned it to a couple people where there's something that's, there's another group that's wanting to start something similar to what they have, is it, what is it, cross side or crossroads? I'm thinking crazy things. Mm -hmm. And they had priests and nuns there, and there's so many similarities there. Well, they were started 600 years after us, uh -huh. and we were existing in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. So it's not impossible that some things were borrowed, more than just our church building. That was true. Yeah. Okay, Nancy, well, last one, because we've got to end this. <laughs> End this. So, what's your question? Um, years ago, in Lumbari, my first came here, and I don't know, maybe some of you will remember when it died out, but like at Christmas, and I don't know what other times during the year, we would, the whole town would have a worship service, sometimes in the Catholic Church, and sometimes in the Episcopal, the Baptist, I found it all of them. And, um, and I don't know when they died out. In yeah. The 80s, maybe, 70s, but it was nice because we were all. Well, you know. All ministers were together. You know, when I was growing up in the mountains, we had kind of the same. They had Christmas plays at every church, and they scheduled them so that you could go to all of them because everybody was related to everybody, and everybody kind of went to all the different churches. So at Christmas time, they would have a service with like the Christmas play at each and every church. And I remember when I was a kid, we would go to like 10 or 15 of these different churches throughout December because they had them on different days. And it was always interesting to, to, to do that. And you're right, it's interesting that they've died out because they were always so good, you know? Well, back in the public school, when I was in high school, and all the public schools then, always had a Christmas service at the Christmas songs and, and, this was, and then of course that's 
that's illegal now, you know. It's illegal to have Christmas services in, in public spaces, so. Well, hmm? No one has asked me the meaning of the word. They did tell me they were going to go look it up. So as I was leaving the church, well, as they were leaving the church and I was at the back, they did mention to me, you know, I'm going to go look it up because you're right, I really don't know it. So there are there were three or four people that said they were going to. I have to quiz them next time, see if they did. Well, on that note, let us do a quick closing prayer so we can end this for today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, and we ask you to continue to guide our Lenten journey, that as we continue to grow in our knowledge and love of you, we may truly become the men and women that you've called us to be. For we ask all these things through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you all for coming.